It's a wonderful day in the homie hood. A wonderful day for a homie. Won't you be my homie to Taro? Okay, whatever. Let's just dive in. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be speaking tonight. Um... I guess we are. We can listen on like. We'll start at one point two five speed and see how far we get. And thank you so much for having me. So. This September marked the 10 year anniversary of the dating app Tinder's release. Yeah, let's give, let's give it a woo. <laughs> Though it followed gay dating apps, Grindr and Scruff, its 2012 launch is widely considered a watershed moment in the normalizing of hookup culture. And much like the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s, the hope was that hookup culture would too usher in a new era of sexual liberation, primarily for women, one swipe at a time. So, What's happened in the 10 years since hookup culture was catapulted into the mainstream? Well, if the research is anything to go by, much of the same issues that affected our dating lives had either persisted or gotten worse. Now, a portion of criticism about hookup culture is undoubtedly driven by moral panic, but it is difficult to look at the shift at hooking up's prominence as a net positive. At least it certainly is in my mind. Now, I would like to make clear from the outset I am not against hookups, no string situations, or friends with benefits as concepts. Some of the best sex and stories come from flings and one night stands. Indeed, a few of my friends were actually surprised to see me arguing for this side of the debate. <laughs> However, <laughs> I do take issue with hookup culture's ubiquity. Its rise as the main form of romantic interaction generationally, generationally rather, and its proliferation. Hookup culture has long been positioned as something to liberate women from the sexist shackles of sexual conservatism. Women's desires, wants, and needs prioritized in a dynamic that understands that women are also sexual beings and equally deserving of sexually fulfilling experiences. In theory, it allows women to positively explore sexual identities outside of the confines of a committed relationship. Except in its current form, certainly between men and women, this isn't always the case. The rise of hookup culture hasn't led to a decline in slut shaming, as has been argued, or the erosion of sexist double standards. Just last month, videos unpacking women's body count, the number of individuals that they've slept with, were watched over 500 million times on TikTok. In a vast sum, the higher a woman's body count was, the more vitriol there was for her in the comments. So it's unsurprising that, as has historically always been the case, women were more likely to minimize the number in question and men more likely to over-index. As, as that becomes no normalized, though, like, I think the, uh, the, the slut shaming will go down over time, right? Like, but because there are, I don't know, gi gigantic TikTok platforms who are saying, like, this is my body count. Although, for the record, I've, I've, I've never referred to the amount of people you slept with as that. But I, theoretically, I think, you know, since this is a relatively new phenomenon for people to be out there telling the whole world how many people they slept with like i think you know that number should go down and just because it exists doesn't mean it's it's right or you can't call that out as marie bugstrom notes in her book the new laws of love her female interviewees were drawn to the clandestine covert nature of dating apps that ensured a lack of proximity from peers because at the end of the day they still feared being judged now this is Right. Is, isn't saying like, oh, well, we shouldn't do this because people are slut shaming. Isn't that in a way a bit of like victim blaming? Right. Like, uh, so, yeah, if anything, it should condemn the way that men view women's sexual sexuality. Yeah. Like if we why don't we shame those people in the TikTok comments? Quite different to the sexually empowered future that defenders of hookup culture normally depict. By and large, women are still treated as though sex is something that they lose or something that they give up. And men still treat women often as notches on bedposts and sex as something to score. The power play that hookup culture hoped to erode remains, and the language around these interactions rarely depicts a mutual exchange. Women are still treated as though sex takes something from them, as if they're left walking around with missing parts of themselves after an encounter like anthropomorphic Swiss cheese. Then... I don't know. That's the, I feel like that's a very broad like statement to make, that like when, when women... Uh, engage with hookup culture, they get something taken from them. Like that's just that, that's just an opinion, right? Like how do you even back up a statement like that? There is what I think is perhaps the biggest travesty of hookup culture: its exacerbation of what it was alleged to fix. 
The idea has been that si the idea has been that since sex is now more accessible, more sex is being had, and more sex should essentially mean better sex. Practice makes perfect, right? But hooking up is not creating better sex. It doesn't even mean that people are having more of it. Instead of creating a sexually equal landscape, the orgasm gap for women remains as wide as it ever was. In a study with responses from over 12,000 undergraduates, it was noted that in first time hookups, 31% of men and just 10% of women reached orgasm. Comparatively, in their last committed relationships, 85% of men and 68% of women reached orgasm. This is also reflected in research presented at the International Academy of Sex Research that also showed women are more likely to orgasm whilst in serious relationships compared to hookups. Maybe they're just edging though. I'm just saying, maybe it's the rise of uh, ed edging. People are having less orgasms, but better quality ones. Men have also been found to be less likely to perform oral sex than women are during a hookup. That's not right. That's not right, all right? Men, if you're out there listening to this, you, you know, you need to be performing oral sex, okay? Just, just, just get used to it. Another reason why you can't compare Grindr to Tinder is uh, gay sex say, stays winning, true. Now, in her book, American Hookup, The New Culture of Sex on Campus, Lisa Wade outlines the typical rules for a hookup. No feelings, don't get attached. Don't be jealous when they sleep with someone else, that old nutshell. Don't be awkward or insecure about sex. Don't act like you're all that into them don't want to see them all that much, don't get upset if they don't text again. Now, please do excuse my French, but the term fuck buddy seems to have fallen out of fashion. All, the, all of those things that she just listed, to me, that sounds like really bad, if not straight up like toxic advice. Perhaps because even the expectation of friendship in this dynamic is considered too much. The dreaded catching of feelings is deemed scarier than catching STIs. I'm serious, just look at the research. A study of 71 college students found that nearly half of participants were not concerned about contracting sexually transmitted diseases during hookup, and the casual nature of these arrangements means multiple partners at once, so it makes the risk of catching them substantially higher. Wade argues hookup culture tells students that their frontal lobes are in charge, that they can be logical about sex and control their feelings if they choose to. Hooking up, they claim, can and should be emotionless. I don't know. I don't know where she's getting these these claims like i think you should be logical about sex and hooking up um but i don't think it necessary like you shouldn't be emotionless either now this lack of emotion as well as the vulnerability and trust that hookup culture tends to prohibit can make communication about sexual wants within a casual dynamic substantially more difficult the International Academy of Sex Research found that some women feel uncomfortable being honest about their sexual desires with men that they don't know well. And on the flip side, men's standards tend to slip when it's women that they don't know. I'm not going to try as hard when it's with someone I don't really care about, said a 26-year-old man quoted in the New York Times article about this study. What? Come on. One man. One man said he does, doesn't care. I mean, like, I don't know. The, the, the data she's pulling from, it seems very much to me... Um, like setting up a straw man and being like, listen how stupid these arguments are. Like, well, yeah, these are really stupid, stupid arguments. It's been argued that hookup culture is part of a broader move towards individualism in the West. And this certainly checks out to me. The other person's pleasure and feelings are often demoted in pursuit of one's own. And because of this, hookups rarely facilitate the environment that's often needed to create the best sexual encounters. There is a level of emotional intelligence required that's been actively and at times aggressively eroded from these pseudo relationships. Wade continues, the skills needed for managing hookup culture are in direct contradiction to the skills needed to propose, build and sustain committed relationships. Now I would personally add to that that these are also skills required for good sex. So much of hooking up relies on a lack of openness that is usually required to communicate sexual desires in order to have fulfilling experiences. Okay, so I guess I would kind of agree here, although I would say that, like, you can engage with hookup culture while also being a very good communicator. In fact, that is probably the best case scenario. Like, it, in a way, uh, hooking up can still, uh, like, require a lot of openness and communication, right? But uh, it's being framed here as something that is inherently uh, like anti-communication or, or is like closing you off. 
the emotional policing, feigned nonchalance, the attempts to out aloof the other party are often draining. But also they tend to undermine one of Never never strive to out aloof. Like you can you can have uh sex, you can engage with hookup culture and and uh be very like direct and open and communicative. Now, t now you know. I should state that I'm a very happily married man. It's been a while since I've had to engage with uh, hookup culture, but um, you know, in my day, uh, I like the more experience I got. It was like the the more important I found the uh, communication to be of the primary reasons why most people, or rather most single people, tend to have sex, which is fun. People live in constant fear of being labeled needy or clingy if one accidentally blurs the often liquid boundaries of what a hookup constitutes as. Anyone who deviates from this, man, woman, non-binary, is seen as a loser in a game, in all, sorry, is seen as a loser of a game that all parties involved will not admit to playing. And regardless of the stereotypes, genuine connection is probably something that men don't need less of, given recent reports of a burgeoning loneliness crisis. Casual. That is true, I guess. Like men are particularly like lonely and apparently having less sex. Um, I don't. I think I don't even know. Is hookup culture going to be good for men? Um, again, like I think the broader advice is just like be communicative. Try to seek out like substantial relationships, not superficial ones. Sex is not impossible. It's not even undesirable, but it is not being navigated in the best way in the current landscape. For many, emotions of some kind do arise and the mismanagement of them leads to confusion for all parties involved. Daters are now being bogged down with a new set of neuroses in relation to these ill-defined relationships. New bad dating habits have emerged, and every week there is a new article about another toxic dating trend, whether it be ghosting, zombieing, breadcrumbing, or various other equally strangely titled but strained interactions. What is what is zombieing? I actually don't know it, because I've been out of the game, you know. So it's like zombieing. Um, as the name suggests, it's when an old online dating match or an old flame arises from the dead. It's the opposite of ghosting. Basically, it's becoming increasingly more popular due to lockdowns and social distancing. But knowing what zombieing is and how to handle it when it happens are two different things. Okay. So it's like when a ghost becomes unghosted. So many people are turning their backs on it. Not sorry, many people are turning their backs on it because it's not working for them. It's well documented that millennials are having less sex than generations before them, but Gen Z are also reportedly going through a similar sex recession. Members of the so-called celibacy TikTok have tired of the emotional repression required for hookups and go as far as arguing that casual sex is in itself oxymoronic. Whilst I might not agree entirely with that its assertion, I do agree with the idea that people are feeling increasingly objectified and used by experiences that should be mutually beneficial and enjoyable. The real sexual revolution, it would seem, is happening independently, with women increasingly exploring their sexuality alone and without shame during masturbation. You know, good. That sounds great. You know, like um, if people want to discover their own sexuality uh, independently, um, that I think is like a fantastic thing to encourage. Also, I, I am thinking that there's another straw man here when she says that people are having less sex. Um, but like, why are people having less sex? Is it really just because of like hookup culture and how how bad it is? I don't I don't think so. I think there's a lot of like economic cultural factors that don't just have to do with like Tinder existing. What is that? My time. <laughs> I have no idea how this bell system works. <laughs> well, how long have I got? Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> so part of the hysteria in relation to hookup culture is a backlash against feminism's gains, and that's no doubt. Yeah, lots of people live at home. Like I feel like I'm about to go on a pure polyev tangent here. Lots of people live at home with their and they can't get out of their mom's basements, and they're not able to bring home people from the tinder apps and but you know what i'm gonna remove the gatekeepers and i'm gonna make sure you incels are getting the pussy that you deserve the new sexual landscape brings us closer to a world in which sex is viewed without a puritanical lens that being said it's inaccurate to write everyone off that is critical as pearl clutchers most women i know are like myself not arguing against it from an ethics point of view but rather looking at the present state of affairs and wanting more for all parties involved 
Many of its supporters engage with what hookup culture should look like, as opposed to what it currently does look like in actuality. In Donna Freitas' book, The End of Sex, she claims that hookup culture promotes bad sex, boring sex, drunken sex that you don't remember, sex you couldn't care less about, sex where desire is entirely absent, sex that you just have because everyone else is. And she suggests that sex itself is becoming more mechanical as a result of so much repression of emotion. Whether it be within a relationship or outside of one, men and women deserve universally great sex. But has hookup culture brought us closer to this goal? The answer is... It's true. Make sex great again, y'all. In my opinion, broadly no, and I cannot personally defend its virtues until it's an emphatic yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, that's part one of four. So let's see, let's uh let's get the clap back here. Um Okay. Um thank you, Miss Acting President. First of all, can we shout out to the bandana? I love how like it's this like formal setting. Everyone's wearing black, and uh, this girl's stepping up to the mic with the the red bandana. Given us the utmost privilege to speak on a topic that we care most dearly about, and friends who have come down to watch this all unfold tonight. Thank you. This really is a blood versus Crips debate going down here. Thank you for being here, I'm so glad you came. Um, I would also like to send a special thanks to India, who actually invited myself to speak on this debate. So it's really nice to see like a friend from ENDS actually like be here. So um, and just just a massive thanks to her. Her speech was just bloody amazing. Um, it's just nice to see you on my side. Anyways, back to the actual debate. As someone who's actually had a shag in the past week, we do believe. <laughs> we. <laughs> <laughs> So British. It's so British to say, like, oh, we had a shag. We do actually believe that this house should not regret the rise of hookup culture. You see, hookup culture is something that paints itself differently for others, and so the essential thing to discuss is how casual sex affects marginalised perspectives. And so tonight, we'll platform queer ones. Um, I'm an asexual myself, so that's so, so a lot to discuss here. And so furthermore, I will explore the fact that we need to remedy the heterosexual and the, patri the patriarchal ideals pressured onto peer onto peer, onto queer and female presenting people like me, because we're all here for a good time and not a long time. Um, bit of sad news, we actually got broken up the other day by text, um, which I can't lie, it was a bit of a long day. And so we'll come back to how language and barriers are so important in debates like these. And so I hope you come away from these chambers as stronger allies, acknowledging that hookup culture can be appreciated in a queer lens and how the importance of language is inextricably underlined in it all, regardless of sexuality. But first of all, what does it mean to be queer? So in my eyes, I've already mentioned that I'm ace, but I'm also bi. And so the former means that I just don't feel sexual attraction to anyone. We kind of thought everyone felt this way um, until about secondary school. And it doesn't help that I had a twin brother who was like my polar opposite. And so asexuality allowed me to reclaim what relationships meant for us. Um, so that just meant, you know, really emphasizing the importance of platonic and romantic relationships. And so in light of hookup culture, you may ask, what does this mean? Um, so being gay just means you just have to work around things in your own little way because believe it or not, asexual people can have sex too. But we don't owe anyone the attraction that we just won't give. But it's not all doom and gloom because this is where consent and language are vital. If anything, we ace people are just receptive to a warmth that we feel amongst others and that's not, that's inherently just not sexual. Call it a yesified sleepover if you must. And while, asex and, and while sexuality is in this so while sexuality is a spectrum, being asexual just means that we lean more closely to one side of it. We also make up 1% of the population, and so sometimes being ace can feel lonely. Sex and sexuality are two very different things, but what they both share is this variety of passion. The beauty of the spectrum is that they all fluctuate, and you never have to feel tied to identify as one way if you don't fancy it. But when you do, you can be as comfortable in it as possible. Just do what makes you feel right. Or who makes you feel right? Anyways, <laughs> another lens to appreciate is understanding how hookup culture is a, like presented in media. For queer people like myself, the likes of Heartbreak High, Heartstopper, and Sex Education dramatize our realities. We end up becoming the media we consume. And so, let's well, I will just like say that I do like Sex Education as a show. You know, so I might maybe uh, maybe I have consumed this media. Let's empower and educate ourselves and each other from it. If anything, it's a necessity, because hookup culture is already branded as something either worthy of gossip or extremely to be by others. And when bombarded and grown up under this mindset, it's just a very long day. Another point to mention is the significance of language in these very intimate situations. And now I hope I don't speak for myself when I say that some of my most intimate moments have been with people that I just haven't spoken to ever again. Um, we think it's this sense of loneliness that we just crave fulfillment for. You have nothing to lose when there are no strings attached, right? And so the role of language is bifold in its intent here, as I hope to outline both the impact of verbal and body language, two key components in the equation that is hookup culture. 
And so with that in mind, I remember a scene from sex education. So suppose you're in Wales, you're in Mordell High School, and you're stuck in a dreadful sex ed class. You're female presenting, and so you get absolutely slated for embracing the art of having sex, or even just merely discussing it. This scene in particular sparked a lot of the anxiety that I felt with the impending doom of both Christian guilt and misogynistic shame looming over me like a thundercloud waiting to rain on me. However, this was instantly remedied when, when Maeve Wiley um, essentially rebelled. She said something that really, really stuck to us, and all it took was three words. Sex is beautiful. And since then, it kind of struck a nerve that I never really forgot about. Um, she then went on to how it could be creative and funny, and I suddenly felt afforded of all these realities that everyone else around me had just seemed to challenge. And as a modern linguist, um, I'm a French student myself, having safe words in other languages sounds really nerdy, but it's actually really funny. And so, so long as both parties are safe, secure, and trusting in each other, hookup culture remains all around us, and I just refuse to be prepared to allow it to be bashed like the generations before us have done. I mean, I, th I feel like she's laying a lot of groundwork here. I don't know how effectively she is arguing in defense of hookup culture, however. I mean, like, these are just, like, great examples and personal experience but i'm not sure if uh we're getting we're getting progress in in terms of representing her side of the argument we also then went on to remember the scene that she had with isaac who is in a wheelchair the intimacy that was shared on our screens was quite literally something i've never seen before similar to queer relationships interabled relationships i.e a relationship where one partner is disabled um, are more deserving are more than deserving of gratitude and representation um, i do speak for myself because both my parents well, my parents were in an interabled relationship and they are just the happiest they could ever be anyways satisfaction is as simple as a sense of touch and that is a beauty in itself Additionally, hookup culture is empowering in the sense that it quite physically just brings two bodies together. Whether it be your sneaky link in college, so a one night stand after park end, casual sex can enable you to learn more about yourself. Your safe word is... Colise? Colise? Is that... Uh, it's like a curse word in French, right? and the boundaries um, that you instill should you engage in it. Inherently, we're all just social creatures, and sometimes it just boils down to wanting to be held. And so my final argument youtube is gonna demonetize my uh, my video if 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 they could all my videos are already demonetized but isn't really an argument it's a poem because who is beau without a poem <laughs> it's actually true anyways reclaiming is a piece that i wrote about someone who kind of made me feel a bit rubbish Abernush. Um, but then I knew better and then secured better um, and now they're my ex but anyways the bottom line is that it embraces the beauty that is hookup culture and the euphoria of consent and it kind of goes a little bit like this Slightly sick and tired, sick and tired by being haunted by your entitlement, sick of being used, abused, thrown down into a shoot. I'm not a commodity, and fuck, I'm certainly not yours. And when I think about you, or you, you made sex for wrong, gross, and just sinful. But, navigating myself in my own terms, I want to take the lead for once. Together, we could form warm ripples in our bodies, human maps we lead and follow each other. And so why not bathe me like I'm baptized, cleanse me of the trauma that cripples me, remind me of the hope that I'm deserving of, the healing I'm entitled to actually sick the thoughts spiral in my mind actually sick because i'm chronically ill but not that i have to be not with you and so as you walk out those doors tonight vote no vote for positivity and vote for liberation in doing so we will continue to advocate the fact that hookup culture is refreshing fun and nothing to ever be ashamed of thank you very much okay i like i like what she said and i think i agree i just wish that maybe she kind of like hammered the message home more like i like just like saying that hookup culture is okay because it allows us to explore our own sexuality in a way that we are sexually like liberated and free um and i don't know i just i just feel like there were maybe too many examples and uh it would have been nicer to like maybe like respond to some of the things that the the person before was saying uh all right but this these are the final two people for this debate so presumably they are uh the best the best of the best they're sending they saving the best uh pokemon for last you know like so we might see some hyper beams yeah most of the arguments put forward could be argue argued to equally apply within relationships yeah like i don't know it might just be the the kind of annoyance of having to argue f within the the confines of how they framed this debate like about hookup culture um but yeah like i i definitely agree with like the sentiment that the the previous speaker 
uh, was saying, I just don't know how how effective it would be at like convincing other people that like hookup culture is is good. So you like, yeah, as you say, you could say you could you could achieve that like sexual liberation or control over your own sexuality and freedom to explore within a relationship. It doesn't it's not necessarily something that is uh dependent on on hookup culture. So let's move on. Let's see what this woman in plaid has to say. Arguing uh, on the side of the house for for Again, or sorry, against hookup culture here. So I think this question, you ha really have to argue. Oh, for this question, you really have to argue a question of medium. I like how the first speaker opened by discussing Tinder as opposed to going straight for largely emotive aesthetic argument. Yeah. Yeah, I think like that's the thing. You need to like get down into like the real world examples, which are things like Tinder and dating apps. and um. But I don't I don't think that first speaker that we listened to either did a necessarily a great job at saying why Tinder is like particularly like this societal like evil. So maybe this woman who for some reason this woman's video is 16 minutes. I'm not even sure how much time you're supposed to get in this, but I know that you can be interrupted as well. So so that might be the case here. Mr. Acting President, I would say thank you for the invitation, but I don't believe you were the president who invited me. Well, certainly not the one I was expecting. I've always personally seen the Oxford Union as a training ground for future British Prime Ministers, and I'm delighted to see you're already practicing for Liz Truss-style terms. Damn, sh taking shots. I also believe you're training for the future idea of Prime Ministers who confuse parties with work meetings. It's just what I've heard on the ground. Now, members of the Oxford Union, first, I must rebut Mr. Dick, your esteemed secretary, Mr. Dick. put forward the argument that this debate is really about the type of world we want to live in. One where ca I must rebut Mr. Dick. Casual sex exists or it doesn't. One where casual sex is stigmatized or it isn't. He had done extensive research on this very university in the 1990s. Well, let me tell you, Mr. Dick, I attended this university in the 1990s. Gather round, children, you're about to learn something. <laughs> That's right, I was here. I was here with Matt Han- Nothing could make this more British than her be telling Mr. Dick and Matt Hancock that hookup culture has existed for, you know, prior to the, <laughs> prior to the existence of uh, Tinder. Yeah, so, yeah, what is going on? Matt Hancock, isn't it? Yeah, in plaid, in in plaid. Yeah, she might as well be wearing like a sexy schoolgirl outfit, right? Hancock, who was then crashing a radio station into a wall. Look it up on Wikipedia. It's frightening. He, of course, no stranger to a fling in a stairwell. Also, I was here with Katie Brand, who wrote Good, Bar Good Luck to You, Leah Grand, also talked about by our esteemed opposition, a sort of te set text, if you will, a film with Emma Thompson about an older woman finding sexual fulfillment. I spent many nights drinking at this Oxford Union with Katie Brand, the author of that film. What I'm saying to you is, in the 90s, we were very much expected to participate, and there was very much casual sex at Oxford University. <gasps> St. Hilda's charged 50p a pop precisely to drive revenue. <laughs> People have always shagged. Have you not seen the favorite, Mr. Dick? People have all. <laughs> Wait, what? The favorite? Is that a, is that just probably some like British reality TV show? And why is she got to keep addressing Mr. Dick like this? Always found a way, but that's not hookup culture, is it? That's our hookup culture. The term hookup first appeared in print in 1993 in the New York Times in an article titled On Language, Stud Muffins, Buzzkill. That's right. The term hookup wasn't even invented till the 90s, but the culture didn't really start till the noughties. And the rise of the culture did not begin till 2012 when Tinder was first invented. I don't know. This is isn't this like a bit weird? She's like setting all this ground, like, "Hey, hookup culture has existed since time immemorial, but also it was 2012, uh, when the Mayan calendar ended, that hookup culture culture actually became a thing." 
Our opposition has told us that the people who are somehow against or stopping hookup culture are pick-me's and pornographic addicted men. But the fact of the matter is, it's the facts that tell us the rise is regrettable. Now, members of the Oxford Union, do not let my pride of Miss Jean Brody suit fool you. Look closer at the Joan from Mad Men cleavage, and you will see that I am no Sandra D asking you to keep your filthy paws off my silky drawers. I am a feminist, okay. and of course I want to live in a world where my every sexual urge is consensually realized, and my personhood is seen as more important than my womanhood. Do I crave, nay demand, the right to make lust to any willing, sizzlingly hot man, woman, or envy without being branded a slut? Come on, YouTube. This is clearly was said envy, not envy. Except when I choose to reclaim my hot, hot sluttiness and have a self-identified hoe face? Of course I do. Do I demand to be- <laughs> YouTube, YouTube subs again said hoe face. Uh, I mean, I don't think she has a hoe face, but she's she said she's going through a hoe phase. Come on. If Fleabag, yes! <laughs> Let's be honest. Respectful casual sex can scratch a very itchy itch. Be magnificently empowering, gifting you the night of your life and a glorious afterglow like the one I have tonight. Maybe it's Maybelline. <laughs> and casual sex can be far preferable to remaining listlessly in the kind of endless, unrewarding relationships that made many women in the past want to scream when I, when I said till death do us part, I had no idea I'd live this long. Hey, what's up, Igloo? We're watching a debate here about uh, the rise of hookup culture. I hope you're having a wonderful day and thanks for joining us. This was all that was open to many of our grandmothers who fought for us to have credit cards, education, and whether they knew it or not, for you to have free reign in the bedroom, in the loose of the Radcliffe camera, and in the Trinity term, of course, the quad. But tonight, we are not talking about access to guilt-free, enthusiastic, casual sex, because that is not where hookup culture ends. Would that it were. Then I'd be right behind it, on top of it, and underneath it. As the mood took me, I'd reverse cowgirl all over it, if that were all of it. Um, this it's not really a mock debate. I think it's like a legit debate. It's this YouTube channel called Oxford Union. I think it takes place at Oxford University, and they basically do like a four v four, um, debate, which is like it's pretty cool. Just because there are some things to celebrate in hookup culture doesn't mean there's not more to regret. Imagine there's no patriarchy. It's easy if you try. You may say I'm a dreamer, and you'd be right. So now. How are patriarchal forces making us regret hookup culture, gang? Well, to me, it's not so much the hookups as the culture. As soon as there is a culture, there is something we must opt into or opt out of, both of which are exhausting. Hookup culture can lower our self-esteem before we've been in the room with another human being. Do you even know how many people have swiped left on you today? No, but if you're on Tinder, Grindr, Bumbler, Hinger, Minja, Hapner, OkCupid, Scruff, Lex, or Field, or any of the other apps on which you can play sexual your roulette, you know that we are all reduced to goodies in the shop window with price tags. Now, the second speaker of the opposition spoke very well, but she spoke about a woman's right to choose. And this I must address. The psychologist Dr. Barry Schwartz, who wrote The Paradox of Choice, has studied the science of choice for 45 years. He knows more than any of us. He is the world academic on choice. He demonstrates our brains enjoy choosing, but max out at around nine things. And that's a neurological fact. He, that's the same for breakfast cereals and lovers. We all know the experience of choice overload shopping online or in the United States of America. Well, guess what? A short study on speed dating examining 84 speed dating groups discovered the wider variety of people the daters had to choose from, the fewer people they chose. And if the variety was too large, people tended to choose no one at all. Now this you know what? I feel like this could be true. Um... You know, one one of my pet peeves about going to a restaurant sometimes is that, like, the menu is too big, you know? Like, I just want, like, five really good options when I go to a restaurant to eat. I don't want to know that they can cook, like, every exotic dish on the planet, you know? I just want the one thing that they make the best because that's why I've come to this this restaurant. You know, I don't I don't want too much choice because then I also like takes me forever to read the menu and then sometimes I just like give up and then I also have regret because I could have got the salad and I shouldn't have got the shepherd's pie.
this one was nice, this one was cute, this one was cute and nice, but didn't ask any questions, etc., etc., etc. I can't decide. Now you've all stayed up all night long, swiping, 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 and you've never met anyone after that session. Is that not true? Now, he suggests, Dr. Barry Schwartz, that for every nine people you swipe right on, you make a rule, a promise to yourself that you meet up with at least one. Lol, Dr. Barry Schwartz. I'll see you on Field and Time Waster and Ghoster and all the other apps where people will ask you to send nudes and then dis a fucking peer. Hookup culture sounds exciting, sexy, stimulating, but mostly the only thing getting off is our phone screen. If your iPhone had a clitoris, at least somebody would be enjoying themselves. Even when you do meet up with somebody off an app, the sexy frisson you have when you meet someone at a party is entirely absent, giving the whole idea of a hookup app is to alert those around you that you're both horny and adjacent. There's nothing less arousing to me than a penis that is already erect before it sees me. I prefer the penis in question to have been flaccid for some weeks, buoyed into life only by my sex appeal. <laughs> Tonight, a friend <laughs> said to me as I left for this debate, every date now feels like a bad job interview that you're never going to get the job for. Let's look at this feminist issue through the lens of our collective humanity, because as radical as this idea remains in this house or in... Yeah, I feel like she, so far from what we've seen, like, her arguments are kind of, like, killing it the best. I mean, uh, like, she's she's done a lot of, like, setting a great framework for her for our, her arguments, you know? Like, she's claiming to be a feminist and, and kind of, like, coming from this perspective as well. In fact, any house, women are people. In 2011, at the dawn of hookup culture, on the eve of the invention of Tinder, when some of you, I believe, were just seven years old and still believed in Santa, and some of us were older and still believed in the perfect one-night stand, Tulane University's Lisa Wade, PhD, already familiar to this house because of my colleague, Yomi Adegoki, who was also a fan. Yeah, I agree. Like, they, uh, in terms of even just, like, oration alone, uh, this woman is, is so far winning. <laughs> Well, Lisa Wade conducted multiple surveys and discovered that approximately one third of the students found their casual sexual relationships traumatic or very difficult to handle. A majority reported their hookups to be, if not traumatizing, very disappointing. And that laugh tells me this house has identified heavily with that description. Let wait, nobody laughed. Wait, nobody laughed. And I guess like, okay, with this argument here, right? Um, so they're saying that one third of these uh, hookups were well. Lisa Wade conducted multiple surveys and discovered that approximately one third check. of the students found their casual sexual relationships traumatic or very difficult to handle. A majority reported their hookups to be, if not traumatizing, very disappointing. Right. So I guess I would say, like, well, what I mean, what statistics are you comparing this to? Like, these are statistics from like right now. Is it true that like 25 years ago, uh, one third of like sexual encounters were uh, not tra tra traumatizing? Has that number really gone up? Or actually, I, I would actually think and hope that that number has gone down because society has become more woke over that time. And um, also, like, was sex really like that much more no, satisfying in in the 80s or 70s? I like less. Um, we we would have to would have to know that additional data. Less amusingly, one in ten reported that they had been sexually coerced or assaulted by their sexual partner in the last year. Dr. Wade concluded that only about a quarter of students do well in hookup culture. To Again, as compared to what though? Like, so this is, I don't know. Is if we're saying that hookup culture is something that started in 2012 but like where is the data prior to that and how is this is is this really worse quote her notably my research suggests that hookup culture is a problem not because it promotes casual sex but because it makes the destructive form of casual sexual engagement feel compulsory students who don't hook up can end up being socially isolated while students who do engage in this way are forced to operate by a dysfunctional set of rules and hookup culture encourages a punishing emotional landscape where caring for others or even simple courtesy seem inappropriate, while carelessness and even cruelty are allowed. Well, I mean, because they're allowed, I think, because, like, it's not hookup culture that, like, allows, like, patriarchy or people to be ab abused in some of these instances, right? Like, it's, it's, and, and also the speaker before her on, on her side of the house also said that people are having less sex than ever. But then also this woman is now saying that people feel 
uh, coerced to, into participating in the culture. But I mean, is that is that how can how can both of those things be true? That people are having less sex, but also more pressure into having sex, um, which like leads to them having less sex, I guess. I don't know. We all know that's true in our hearts. We know we felt coerced to send pictures. We know we felt desperate and sad and alone because of it. If you would humor me, please close your eyes so no one can see, see how anyone else is responding. Just everyone just close their eyes and say, mm, if you have experienced, while engaging in hookup culture, the following. One, say, mm, if you've experienced power games. Two. Wait, what? I guess, I guess uh, they should, she should give a concrete definition to what like power games is. And say, mm. If you have experienced, while engaging in hookup culture, the following. One, say, mm, if you've experienced power games. I guess, in a way, isn't, it's like, it, uh, I guess, yeah. I guess it depends on how broadly you want to define power games, right? And also, did power games not exist before the rise of hookup culture? Two, feelings of low self-esteem. Again. Was this something that existed before hookup culture? Three, feelings of being used. Again. Mm, the mm's are getting louder, aren't they? Four, ghosting. Anyone who says they haven't been ghosted is lying. Um, I don't know. Ghosting, like the that's like specifically a word that exists within the context of like the modern dating culture. Right. So, of course, like, how could how can someone ghost you before in like the 50s? Like they did like they didn't pick up their phone like when you had to like dial them on a rotary phone. Um, exactly. These things, these are phenomena that all existed before uh, the rise of hookup culture, if if we can even call that. And I mean, she set the groundwork of saying that this is something that we're talking about from like 2012 onwards. So. Five, gaslighting. Six, toxic traits. Seven, disappointment. <laughs> and eight, any behaviors you've seen in Entourage Succession or any film featuring Russell Brand. <laughs> now, say... So, I don't know. I, th I feel like she did a great job, like, setting the groundwork for her arguments, but now it's, it's kind of falling apart for me. If during genuine hookup culture, you've experienced honest and open communication that has resulted in a fulfilling experience and warm, friendly feelings towards your sexual partner, along with mutual respect in genuine hookup culture, say, mm. just the opposite. I don't know. I think that this is, uh, this, this argument here, right? Because like, as soon as you meet somebody that you are very compatible with, and that you can have an honest and open relationship with uh, for an extended amount of time, then it's no longer, I don't think people, people no longer categorize that as being part of hookup culture. Suddenly, even though it's the result of, of engaging with hookup culture and now you found this thing, that relationship, now that it's being cast in a positive light, is, uh, is that no longer exists within the 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 confines of what they're defining as hookup culture here. So gaslighting is based on a movie from the 50s. True. I don't think she's arguing that they don't exist before hookup culture. If you'll note, she cited something from the year before Tinder's inception. Her argument is instead that hookup culture catalyzes or, or proliferates these phenomena. I Yeah, like I I'll agree. Like that's obviously like part of her argument here. And I don't think she's like so daft as to, as to say that but um but she needs the more data like she's referring to data um to say that uh you know this like there one in three people are traumatized in their in modern dating and then like well how does that how does that how is that different than than previous data sets of data so I don't know. I, I agree with you. I don't think she's like so naive to, as to be saying that this does didn't exist before. I just think she does kind of like fail to to make uh, that that difference with, and she's it's 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 almost just like um, insinuating that because it's it's in, in a way I think playing on our perceptions of how we kind of like perceive modern dating as like oh dating is so horrible and like you know. Um, 
nobody wants to be doing it and like so i think it is playing to our bias already because you know even the whole way this thing is framed as hookup culture like there's already i think a stigma when you hear hookup culture and again what she's saying here as soon as you meet someone good through this process of hookup culture then it's because it's good it's no longer part of hookup culture uh even if you know just about everyone you know uh, probably has met their current par partner through the same process that is facilitating hookup culture. But are all those all are once you find a healthy relationship, it's no longer hookup culture. Why? Because the because of the stigma specifically around that word. I I think so. I I I do disagree with her here. Position. How interesting. <laughs> Please open your eyes. Open your eyes. Look around the room. Oxford is a hot house, and it is highly probable someone here was umming about you. <laughs> now, according to the Kinsey Institute study in 2013, just one year after Tinder, only 26% of women participating in university hookups reported positive feelings after the event, whereas 50% of men reported a positive experience in the same situation ship. But that's 50% of the 50% of men who can get a date. You have to understand that the, the bottom 50% of men, by what is considered to be a patriarchal sense of attractiveness, can't get a date at all. And I don't know if I'm... <laughs> that was pretty funny timing. Does that mean time's up? I don't know if that was calling time or an endorsement. Uh, and while 88% wait she doesn't have she just keeps going though there's still like another like five minutes how do you how is your time time up and you keep going uh feminists definitely use the men's right activist ladder theory right is she isn't this the theory that like what oh 20 per the top 20 percentile of men are getting 100 percent of the woman is, is she is she endorsing that here right and again she used data she said hey here's the data but she didn't compare the data from 2013 to the data in 2010. She compared the data in 2013 for women to the data to 2013 in men. So again, it was just like, okay, you made a comparison, but it wasn't the comparison that we needed. Sense of men and, and, and I mean, like, to her credit, she did get the house to kind of like go wild, but not because I don't think her, because her argument was good, but because her rhetoric was good. Orgasm during the last hookup, only 11% of women did. 11% of women happen to be lesbians. <laughs> but I have no way of knowing if these two facts are connected. Okay, that's her. This is her whole argument, though. She has no way of knowing if these two facts are connected. I think that's why her argument falls apart for me, is because she keeps connecting things and implicitly, I, I do want to agree because of my bias, though. But because of the bias I have, like hookup culture is is in a way I'm I feel like we're all kind of biased against it. Or at the very least, those who participate it, we also I, I mean, I, OK, I don't participate in it, in it anymore. But those who participate it, you know, there's always like, oh, like it's like, oh, I can't believe I have to do this thing. Like, you know, it's it's like it's like, oh, what a drag. Like, oh, this is like a bad thing. But you have to do it because you don't have like what other choices you have. From the advent of Tinder till now, we've seen increasing numbers of people dissatisfied with hookup culture. And I will end on this. Okay. Like she's saying there, have we, can we point to that data that says increasingly dissatisfied? Yes. From the Gen Xers to the elderly millennials, there's been a global awakening that while sex can be lovely, the culture that causes competitiveness, FOMO, and emotional deadening is making us less happy every year. As in so many things, the environment, the gender binary, mental health, gun control, Gen Zs, you are wiser than your elders. You show us the way. In August 2022, the international press announced that a hinge survey revealed that Gen Z is killing hookup culture. For what? 25% of you said you'd missed out on dating over the two years of pandemic lockdowns, and it has changed your dating habits for the better. 91% of you said that you didn't want to waste time on the wrong person. And overwhelmingly, you, Gen Z, told Hinge that you were looking for someone with whom you had a deeper connection. 78% of Hinge users, Gen Zs, 
are investing in your mental health, and 97% said they are looking to date someone who's looking after theirs. And that included not just swiping and swiping and swiping and hoping and hoping and hoping and having a series of emotionally deadening experiences. Jen said, it is you who have taught us that so many of our ways of thinking, being, living, and loving are unsustainable, disposable, and regrettable. And to you, I bow in humility, as I know that you will choose once and wisely tonight by swiping right on the motion that this house finds the rise, or more accurately, the fall, of hookup culture regrettable. And I'll see you in the bar for a slow, comfortable winning argument against you all. Thank you. Okay. I, I think, like, it's a strong finish there. I guess that is a curious thing about Gen Z uh, the g killing, you know, I guess, you know, millennials killed uh, avocado toast or whatever, and Gen Z is killing uh, hookup culture. So you're jealous of hookup culture, but not a hater who wants it to disappear. Well, have you, have you considered joining our Discord and where for only $50 a month, we can teach you how to be an absolute chat? and uh and you know be a, the king of hookup culture um she is giving off so many red flags two years of lockdown in the uk where infamously they let everyone get covid that is true covid might be something that is also killing hookup culture i'm sure people probably do want to be a little more uh um cautious with the amount of time they're investing in someone and uh might not want to get covid for um how do they put it a snog uh a, 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 a sneaky snog um i really really have to pee but i i promise uh i guess i can just watch on my phone um because i want y'all to to get the the best experience here on on the show um and uh, I just have to very quickly. Snog just sounds like a kiss. That is true. It is just a kiss. A shag then, you know, a sneaky shag. Um, all right. So let's watch the end. The, this is the last, the final, the final boss here for Hookup Culture. Good evening, everyone. I can only hope you're enjoying yourself so far, because if you're wondering which member of the Oxford Union Committee I'm noticing this mic on this side of the house is a little louder. So that does, that is a bit of an unfair advantage. If he decided we'd have a debate on hookup culture, you need not look any further. Personally, I will take making eight people talk about sex in the Oxford Union Chamber as one of my greatest achievements. But now I have the honor of summing up a truly excellent debate where you have heard arguments about contraception, relationships, language, and more. I'll admit, I was slightly worried when thinking about this speech. Firstly, because does, these debates involve such prestigious speakers. I realized I would have to follow hookup culture experts like Matthew Dick and Daniel Dipper. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I wondered if I would have anything left to say. Not only that, but when I turned to my trusted persuasive techniques such as personal anecdotes, I remembered that my grandparents would be watching this speech and thought that probably wasn't the way to go. <laughs> Thankfully, though, several years of education at a girls' school, love of all things women, and a bit of time in Oxford sparked inspiration. And it's going to be a very simple argument. I'm going to talk to you about women tonight. I'm going to tell you why regretting the rise of hookup culture sets feminism back. Why a belief that hookup culture provides anything other than choice and liberation simply plays into the hands of the stereotypes that we are working to break down. I think Bo did an incredible job of explaining the impacts to the queer community, which allows me to discuss the more heteronormative, traditional binaries we have seen ingrained in society. But before I get into that, after coaching beginners debating for the last two terms, it would be hypocritical not to follow my own instructions, which is always start with rebuttal. So a few things to note. Dan tells you that hookup culture means short-term gratification over long-term commitment. I think he misunderstands that relationships and hookup culture are not mutually exclusive. They might be at the time, but it's perfectly possible for me to engage in hookup culture and then a month later get into a relationship. I'm also not clear what is wrong with just enjoying having sex short-term and some short-term gratification. Secondly, he tells you that hookup culture is too self-centered. I think Dan is talking about bad hookup culture. Any one-sided sexual interaction is bad. I think that when hookup culture is an established, normalized part of society, you can decide what you want, you can discuss it, and you can have a far more balanced relationship. Secondly, let's come on to Gail then. I was going to do rebuttal to Gail, but I was so enthralled and confused by her speech that I will move on for now. <laughs> Years of debating hasn't prepared me for pubic hair rebuttal quite yet. <laughs> Yomi tells you that sex is bad for women. I think Yomi is right that sex is generally much less fulfilling for women. But this is true in relationships too. 
And when the primary purpose of an exchange is to have sex, it's far easier to say, look, I'm not enjoying this. Unless you make this better for me, we're not doing this anymore. So yes, I think we can fulfill female pleasure much better under this side of the house. Come on, we need to step it up, boys. <laughs> Go on then. I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> Let's come on to Deborah then. Deborah spends quite a long time making our case and then says that the problem is that you have to opt in or out of hookup culture. But I don't think it's very hard to say no to hookup culture. I think it's actually emotionally a lot easier than rejecting someone who genuinely is really interested in you as a person. I also think the fact that Deborah is so aware of the potential problems with hookup culture, you know, for example, she talks about apps quite a lot, is why the culture is good, because you know what you're getting into. You didn't have this in the 90s, that's why Matthew only knew about the 50p St Hilda's thing, which you've corrected him on now. You had to pretend that you liked someone when you went on a date, and I think that that's much worse than just being honest that you just want to shag. <laughs> Um, anyway, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, um, the collective harmonica thing that we all did, I'm, I'm not honestly sure how to rebut, so I think I'll just move on to my speech now. But before I do that, I would like to thank the acting president for this speech and the rest of the committee for this term. This could be my last speech in the chamber. I've had a really wonderful time, so thank you very much. So to begin then. Yeah, how do you do terms at this place? Like, is, do you have to be, I don't think you have to be a student, but you participate to this like debate club. It's, it's, it's kind of cool. It's important to note that because this is a debate about the rise of hookup culture, rather than when it is purely good or bad, we need to consider what we would have if hookup culture did not exist. We must ask ourselves what society would look like without it, as Matthew tells you when he gives you the comparison of having more committed relationships. I think the first thing to consider is that both historically and to this day, it's women who are consistently held back from sex and sexual pleasure. Not only is it just physically harder for women to orgasm, but the backlash faced by women who are deemed promiscuous means that women have been locked out of their sexuality in general, whether that's expressing it or pursuing it or discussing it. The demonization of women that pursue sexuality has happened for hundreds of years. Much to the dismay of my English A-level teachers, I decided to write my English coursework on sex, which not only led to some interesting class discussions, but some revelations about how society has viewed women in their relation to sex. We've lived in a culture where women's bodies have been sexualized by men, then weaponized by men, and as a result, men have contained women's sexuality. A brilliant example of this is in the classic tale of bloodthirsty, ruthless individuals on a quest for power. I'm not talking about tomorrow's elections. I am, of course, referring to the Victorian novel, Dracula. If you haven't had the chance to read Dracula, it has a very interesting attitude to female sexuality. Firstly, it portrays female vampires as incredibly sexual beings. Out of context, you would at times be unclear whether you're reading about a vampire attack or the kind of hookup that probably only happens after a drunken crew date. So first, women are sexualized. Then these vampire women attack, and in doing so, they threaten the integrity and the gentlemanliness of the protagonist. See, sexuality being weaponized. Finally, though, and perhaps most interestingly, the real driving force behind the plot of Dracula is purification purifying these vampires of whatever evil lies within them. And when this is applied to the female characters in the novel, there is an incredible emphasis placed on the restoration of their good, pure selves. This is achieved when the male characters stake the female vampires through the heart in passages which many feminist critics have analyzed as representing a kind of gang rape. Finally then, you see female sexuality be decisively contained. I realize I've just spent quite a while on what you might just think is a silly gothic novel, but I think the themes here are incredibly pertinent to this debate. Because while this is a culture from 100 years ago, the narratives have not been completely destroyed. We I've never read uh, Dracula, but I have watched Castlevania on Netflix twice. We still see many images of the female temptress as opposed to the schoolgirl virgin, for example. In more modern terms, this looks like incel culture, who have whole theories devoted to analyzing women's sexual behaviors. They categorize women based on sex as Stacey's or Becky's. Now, you might think that's a bit of an extreme. And of course, I think the narratives have shifted overall. I don't look around Attic on a Wednesday night and start spraying the holy water. But it's clear that many perceptions of female sexuality remain. And this isn't just coming from men, it also comes from women. It's very hard to break down years of internalized misogyny. I think even more obvious examples of this look like the idea that men want sex while women give sex, as I think was discussed earlier by Yomi. This is a really harmful perception because not only does it imply that sex is just about male pleasure, but also that when it comes to sex, that women are just objects that men try to get it from. If you're going to bring up Dracula and not mention extreme homoeroticism, I think you're doing it a disservice. True, you might have to elaborate on that, Angel Riot. The containment of women's sexuality makes this even worse because men have traditionally been the ones who control the narrative. So I've given you a lot of background on this topic. Why then has hookup culture helped to resolve the issue? This is because of the change that we see when hookup culture is prevalent. In a world without hookup culture, we still have hundreds of years of misogyny, Dracula still tells you that women are whores, and insults still post online. This means the dominant narratives I've talked to you about still exist. We shame women for sexuality, and we seek to contain it. But in our world, as hookup culture has grown, we've seen increased discussions of women's sexuality. 
Casual sex for both women and men has become normalized. It means that not only do men understand that women have sexual desires in exactly the same way that they do, but that women are also able to finally stop shaming themselves. Bram Stoker was widely thought to be queer, and much of the subsex of Dracula as a character is itself homoerotic. All right. Thanks. Um, I, I gotta say, I do like this argument she's making now, that the problems that we are identifying with uh, hookup culture are simply leftover problems that we've already had in society at large. I'm not going to pretend that hookup culture is perfect. I'll concede that the opposition are right when they say that hookup culture can be dangerous, that it could make you feel worthless, that it could take advantage of women. But hookup culture is not a policy. This motion doesn't say this house would make everyone engage in hookup culture. Hookup culture is about choice. Fundamentally, it gives women a choice that for a long time they didn't have, to be sexual without being shamed, to escape Dracula's chains of confinement. So many of the problems that proposition find with hookup culture stem from other aspects of society. Long-term relationships can be dangerous, long-term relationships can make you feel worthless, and long-term relationships could take advantage of women. It's not clear to me why an abusive relationship, sorry, an abusive experience with hookup culture is any worse than that of an abusive long-term relationship, or why the mental toll of feeling valued for your body is not something that exists underneath the misogynistic status quo. If Boom, that's what we were trying to say before. If this is true, then there are still far more benefits to the existence of hookup culture than not having it at all, because the opposition's points would still stand regardless. This is why choice is so important. We need to stop deciding that women are being used when they partake in this kind of culture. We need to accept that women are in charge of their sexuality and that the existence of hookup culture in the modern day is a reflection of this fact. When we do this, we can see that hookup culture is a feminist culture. I think that's probably enough of me talking about sex for one evening, but I'll leave you with this. We have told women what they should do with their bodies for years and years and years. We still do it today. But tonight, I say vote to let women do what they want. Vote to say in both literal and metaphorical terms, fuck it. Damn. Yeah, I think I agree with this, uh, this final uh, participant in this debate the most. Um, that, you know, yeah, the problems that we have are not with hookup culture, but with society at large. They existed before the, the rise of hookup culture and, and the reasons that hookup culture is perceived negatively. You know, we saw, we saw four women speak. And, and a lot of the problems they identified were still just pointing to the patriarchy and traumatization and bad experiences and being dissatisfied. I mean, that, uh, you know, being dissatisfied is part of uh, coming into yourself as a sexual being, right? Like, you're not, it's not like sex is instantly just uh, something that you understand but you have to you know i think go through some stages of dissatisfaction in order to uh understand what it is that you do like about sex and what you is that you do like and are looking for in a sexual partner so um purple mavis you agree yeah i, th I thought you know what i thought it was it's it was like a good debate um the the last two speakers i think they they must definitely plan for the last two speakers because in in both of the debates that we've watched, they seem to have been the best, the best. And we, I mean, we only watched half. Um, maybe next time, if I'm going to do this again, it might be worth watching the first two, and the last two. I'm also interested because they keep saying that the house is going to vote, um, at the end, and I I'm I'm curious like how the house voted. I feel like this is one of the ones that like it's it might be easy to to get everyone to vote in favor of uh hookup culture is like okay and and a good thing 